humans have an innate curiosity to understand and solve puzzles. Unsolved mysteries offer a tantalizing challenge, and people are often drawn to them in an effort to solve the mystery and satisfy their curiosity. People are often fascinated by the unknown and unexplained. Unsolved mysteries represent a glimpse into a world of uncertainty and intrigue. The Mystery of the Nemi Ships The Nemi ships were two ancient Roman ships that were discovered in Lake Nemi, near Rome, in the early 20th century. The larger of the two ships was over 70 meters long and was considered one of the largest ancient ships ever built. The Nemi ships were built by the Roman Emperor Caligula in the 1st century AD as floating palaces for his personal use. They were incredibly luxurious and had features such as heated baths, mosaic floors and marble columns. The Nemi ships had heating systems. They were built with hypercosts, which were a type of underfloor heating system used in ancient Roman times. The hypercosts consisted of a series of channels and flues beneath the floors of the ships, which allowed hot air to circulate and warm the rooms. In addition to the hypercosts, the Nemi ships also had other heating features, such as furnaces and boilers, which were used to heat water for the baths and to provide heat for other areas of the ships. The heating systems of the Nemi ships were an impressive feat of engineering for their time, and they demonstrate the advanced technological capabilities of the ancient Romans. After Caligula's passing, the Nemi ships were scuttled in the lake and remained underwater for almost 2,000 years until they were discovered in the 1920s. The Italian government raised the ships from the lake in the 1930s and put them on display in a museum built specifically for them. Unfortunately, both of the Nemi ships were destroyed during World War II, and today only a few fragments remain. However, the story of the Nemi ships has captured the imagination of historians and the public alike, and they remain a fascinating example of ancient Roman engineering and extravagance. The Nemi ships are an example of brilliant engineering for their time. The ancient Romans were skilled shipbuilders and engineers, and the Nemi ships were a testament to their expertise. The Nemi ships were some of the largest and most elaborate ships of their time, and they were built with a high degree of craftsmanship and attention to detail. They were also designed to be functional, with features like the hypercost heating systems and other amenities that made them comfortable and livable for their occupants. The fact that the Nemi ships were scuttled and sunk in Lake Nemi and yet remained preserved for almost 2,000 years is a testament to their durability and the quality of their construction. The mystery here is that the ship's discovery proved that the ancient Romans were capable of building large ships. Historians, scholars and researchers often ridiculed the idea that the Romans were capable of building such a large ship, but due to the Nemi ship's discovery, it's caused historians to admit that they were wrong about Roman technology and said that it caused them to question what they were capable of. The Mystery of Greek Fire Greek fire was a weapon used by the Byzantine Empire in the medieval period, primarily during the 7th to 12th centuries. It was a highly effective incendiary weapon that could be used to set enemy ships on fire and cause chaos and destruction on the battlefield. The exact composition of Greek fire is not known with certainty, as the recipe was a closely guarded secret. However, it is believed to have been a type of liquid fire that could stick to surfaces and continue to burn even when exposed to water. Greek fire was typically deployed using a flamethrower-like device called a siphon, which allowed the user to direct a stream of the liquid fire towards their target. It was also sometimes launched in pots or jars, which would break upon impact and release the fire. One of the reasons that Greek fire was so effective was that it was difficult to extinguish. Water could actually make it burn more intensely, and attempts to smother it with sand or other materials were often unsuccessful. The use of Greek fire helped the Byzantine Empire to fend off numerous attacks by enemy forces, including the Arab and Viking fleets. However, over time the technology and techniques for creating and deploying the weapon were lost, and by the 14th century it was no longer used in warfare. The exact composition of Greek fire is not known as no written records of the formula have survived. However, Historians have been able to identify some general characteristics of the weapon based on historical accounts and contemporary descriptions. Historians have detailed some of the general characteristics of Greek fire. It was a liquid fire that could be sprayed or thrown at targets. It was highly flammable and burned fiercely, even when exposed to water. 
It was difficult to extinguish and could continue to burn on water. It could be directed at a specific target using a siphon or similar device. It was sticky and could adhere to surfaces, making it difficult to remove. It was effective against both people and ships. It could cause panic and confusion among enemy troops, helping to break their morale. Although Greek fire is a mystery, historians and researchers have said that Greek fire was a highly effective and feared weapon that helped the Byzantine Empire to defend against numerous attacks. Its exact composition may never be known for certain, but its general characteristics make it clear why it was so effective on the battlefield. What's underneath the Great Sphinx? The question of what is under the Great Sphinx in Egypt is a topic of much debate and speculation among archaeologists and historians. The most widely accepted theory is that there are tunnels and chambers beneath the Sphinx, but their purpose and contents remain unknown. Some archaeologists and Egyptologists believe that the tunnels and chambers may have been part of the complex system of tombs and temples that surround the Sphinx and the nearby pyramids. Others speculate that the chambers may have been used for religious or ritual purposes. In recent years, there have been claims that there may be a secret chamber or even an entire underground city beneath the Sphinx, but there is no scientific evidence to support these claims. It's important to note that any excavation or exploration of the area around the Sphinx would be subject to strict regulations and permits, and any discoveries would need to be carefully evaluated and documented by archaeologists and other experts. With that being said, technology has revealed that there is evidence of tunnels and shafts beneath the Great Sphinx at Giza, but their purpose and extent are still a matter of debate. During various excavations and surveys of the Sphinx and its surrounding area, researchers have identified a number of tunnels and shafts that appear to be of ancient origin. The purpose of these tunnels and shafts is not entirely clear, but they are believed to have been part of the complex system of tombs and temples that were built during the Old Kingdom period in Egypt. Some researchers have speculated that the tunnels and shafts may have been used for religious or ritual purposes or as a means of accessing the underground water table. One idea is that of the Hall of Records. The concept of a Hall of Records hidden beneath the Great Sphinx is a popular but unfounded claim that has been put forward by a number of researchers who've studied ancient Egypt. The idea of a Hall of Records beneath the Sphinx can be traced back to a series of 19th century articles and books by French author Edgar Cayce. According to Cayce, the Hall of Records was a vast library of ancient knowledge and wisdom, containing information about the lost civilization of Atlantis, as well as other lost civilizations and technologies. As of right now, mainstream scientists have said that there is no archaeological evidence to support the existence of such a hall, and the theory has been dismissed by mainstream scholars. Moreover, the idea of a vast underground library being hidden beneath the Sphinx raises many practical questions, such as how such a structure could be constructed and maintained without leaving any trace or evidence. The Mysterious Wangina Cave Paintings The Wangina Cave Paintings are a collection of ancient rock art located in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. These paintings are believed to have been created by the indigenous people of the region, known as the Wangina or Wangina people, who have lived in the area for tens of thousands of years. The Wangina cave paintings are known for their distinctive style and their depictions of humanoid figures with large round eyes and no mouths. These figures are believed to represent the Wangina spirits, who are considered to be the creators of the land and the guardians of the people. The paintings are typically made using red and white ochre and are found in a variety of locations, including caves, rock shelters and overhangs. Many of the paintings are located in remote and difficult to reach areas and are considered to be of great cultural and spiritual significance to the indigenous people of the region. The Wangina cave paintings are thought to be among the oldest examples of rock art in the world, with some estimates suggesting that they may be as much as 40,000 years old. They are an important part of the cultural heritage of the Wangina people, and are also recognized as an important archaeological and artistic resource by the wider world. Due to the depictions of humanoids, it's caused some to suggest that the figures are actually extraterrestrials, further noting that these interpretations can be seen in various cave paintings across the world and suggest that perhaps ancient humans came into contact with something otherworldly. However, historians have said that the Wangina cave paintings do not depict aliens and say that the figures depicted in the paintings 
are believed to represent the one Gina spirits, which are an important part of the indigenous religious and cultural traditions of the Kimberley region of Western Australia. The Sea Serpent Spotted by the Crew of HMS Daedalus The sighting of the HMS Daedalus Sea Serpent occurred on August 6, 1848, when crew members of the British Royal Navy ship HMS Daedalus reported seeing an enormous sea serpent in the waters of the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. According to the accounts, the creature was said to be around 60 feet long, with a head resembling that of a snake or a lizard, and a neck that rose approximately 6 feet out of the water. The creature's body was described as being thick and covered in scales, with a coloration that alternated between light brown and black. It was also said to have humps on its back that moved up and down in a wave-like motion. The sighting reportedly lasted for around 20 minutes and was witnessed by several crew members, including the ship's captain, Peter McQuay. The creature was said to be moving at a speed of around 15 miles per hour and appeared to be heading east. The incident gained widespread media attention and sparked a great deal of debate and speculation about the existence of sea monsters. Some skeptics dismissed the sighting as a misidentification of a known creature, such as a giant squid or a whale, while others believed it to be proof of the existence of previously unknown species. Oddly enough, this creature was sighted and described by those who spent the majority of their life at sea, and so researchers into the unknown have said that they would easily be able to identify sea creatures local to the region, saying that this adds weight to the theory that the crew encountered a mysterious unknown creature. In the years since the sighting, there has been much speculation and analysis of the accounts, with some suggesting that the creature may have been a hoax perpetrated by the crew, or that it was a misidentification of a known animal. However, the sighting remains one of the most well-known and intriguing sea monster reports in history. The Mystery of Sri Lanka's Stargate The Sri Lanka Stargate, also known as the Kotuwe Kard Stargate, is a mysterious artifact located in Sri Lanka that has long fascinated scholars and enthusiasts of the paranormal. The artifact is a circular stone disc, measuring approximately three feet in diameter, with intricate carvings of cosmic and geometric patterns. The origins of the Sri Lanka Stargate are shrouded in mystery, with some theories suggesting that it was created by an ancient civilization with advanced knowledge of astronomy and cosmology. The carvings on the disc are said to depict a variety of celestial objects, including stars, planets, and galaxies, as well as symbols and diagrams related to ancient religious and spiritual traditions. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Sri Lanka Stargate is its alleged ability to act as a portal or gateway to other dimensions or realities. According to some accounts, the disc was used in ancient times by priests or shamans as a means of accessing other realms of consciousness or communicating with beings from other worlds. While the claims of the Sri Lanka Stargate's supernatural abilities remain unproven, the artifact continues to fascinate researchers and enthusiasts of the paranormal. Some have even speculated that the disc may have extraterrestrial origins or that it may hold the key to unlocking the secrets of advanced ancient civilizations. Despite the intrigue and speculation surrounding the Sri Lanka Stargate, the artifact remains a subject of debate and controversy within the scientific and archaeological communities. While some believe that the disc may hold important clues to unlocking the mysteries of the universe, others are skeptical of its alleged powers and origins. Despite the uncertainties surrounding the Sri Lanka Stargate, its mysterious carvings and intriguing history continue to capture the imagination of those who seek to understand the secrets of the universe and the mysteries of the past. Whether or not the artifact holds the key to unlocking these secrets remains to be seen, but its continued study and investigation will undoubtedly inspire new discoveries and insights for years to come. The Mystery of the Lost City of Paititi The city of Paititi, also known as El Dorado, is a legendary lost city that is said to be located somewhere in the jungles of South America, possibly in the Andes Mountains. It is believed to be a vast, wealthy metropolis that was hidden away by the Inca civilization to keep it safe from Spanish conquistadors during the 16th century. According to the legend, the city is made entirely of gold and other precious metals and contains vast treasures beyond imagination, including artifacts, gems and precious stones. It's also said to be home to a powerful ruler who possesses great wisdom and knowledge and who is protected by a fierce army of warriors. 
The story of the lost city has captured the imaginations of explorers, adventurers and treasure hunters for centuries, and many expeditions have been launched in search of the lost city. However, despite extensive searches and investigations, no concrete evidence of the city's existence has ever been found. The legend is believed to have originated from the traditions of indigenous peoples in South America and has been passed down through generations. Some historians and archaeologists believe that the story may have been inspired by real-life events, such as the flight of the Inca emperor Atahualpa during the Spanish conquest of Peru, when he is said to have hidden vast amounts of treasure in the Andes Mountains. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the legend of Paititi continues to inspire speculation and fascination, and the search for the lost city remains a popular topic among adventurers and explorers. The location of the city of El Dorado is uncertain, and has been the subject of much speculation over the years. According to legend, the city is believed to be located somewhere in the jungles of South America, possibly in the Andes Mountains. But the exact location has been a mystery for centuries, with many explorers and adventurers launching expeditions to try to find the lost city. Interestingly, some have suggested that the lost city is in the Amazon rainforest. As of today, Researchers and explorers are constantly making interesting discoveries in the Amazon rainforest, with one of the most recent finds being that of ancient pyramids and roadways. Archaeologists have said that there are ancient archaeological sites and ruins scattered throughout the Amazon region, including impressive examples of pre-Columbian engineering, such as causeways, mounds, and terraced hillsides. The Amazon rainforest is a vast and largely unexplored region, and there is always the possibility that new archaeological discoveries could be made in the future. Despite many claims and rumours of sightings, no concrete evidence of the lost city's existence has ever been found, leading some to believe that it may be purely a mythical place. However, the legend of Paititi continues to inspire speculation and fascination among many, and the search for the lost city remains a popular topic among adventurers and explorers. The Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine is a legendary mine said to be located somewhere in the Superstition Mountains of Arizona, USA. According to the legend, the mine contains a vast fortune in gold and other precious metals, and has been sought after by treasure hunters and adventurers for over a century. The story of the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine dates back to the mid-19th century, when a German immigrant named Jacob Waltz, also known as the Dutchman, claimed to have discovered the mine while prospecting in the Superstition Mountains. According to Waltz, he had stumbled upon a vein of gold so rich that he was able to collect large quantities of ore simply by scraping the surface of the rock with a knife. Over the years, the story of Waltz's discovery grew into a legend, and many treasure hunters and adventurers attempted to locate the lost mine. However, despite extensive searches, the mine was never found and Waltz himself passed away without revealing its location. Despite the lack of concrete evidence, the legend of the lost Dutchman's gold mine continued to inspire fascination and speculation, and many theories and stories emerged about the mine's location and the fate of those who sought it. Some claimed that the mine was guarded by supernatural forces, while others suggested that Waltz had taken the secret of its location to his grave. In the decades that followed, Countless expeditions were launched in search of the lost mine, and many stories emerged of treasure hunters who had supposedly discovered it, only to meet with misfortune or disappear under mysterious circumstances. However, despite the persistent search, the lost Dutchman's gold mine has never been definitively located. Today, the legend of the lost Dutchman's gold mine remains a popular topic among treasure hunters, adventurers, and folklore enthusiasts. While some believe that the mine is purely a myth, Others continue to search for its elusive location, hoping to uncover the vast fortune that is said to lie hidden in the Superstition Mountains. The Mysterious Treasure of Lima The Treasure of Lima is a legendary treasure said to have been hidden by Spanish forces during the War of Independence in Peru in the early 19th century. According to the legend, the treasure consists of a vast collection of gold, silver, jewels and other precious objects, valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. The story of the treasure of Lima dates back to 1820, when Spanish forces were fighting against the forces of Peruvian independence. As the Spanish forces retreated, they are said to have gathered up a vast treasure of gold and silver objects from the churches, convents and palaces of Lima, the capital city of Peru at the time. 
The treasure was reportedly loaded onto a convoy of mules and wagons and transported out of the city under cover of darkness. The convoy made its way across the Andes Mountains to the coast, where the treasure was reportedly hidden in a cave or a remote location. Over the years, the legend of the treasure of Lima has inspired countless treasure hunters and adventurers to search for the lost treasure. Many stories have emerged of treasure hunters who claim to have discovered the location of the treasure, only to be thwarted by deadly traps or treacherous terrain. Despite the persistent search, the location of the treasure of Lima has never been definitively discovered, and the treasure remains one of the most elusive and sought-after treasures in the world. In recent years, however, new evidence has emerged that suggests that the treasure may be located in a complex system of underground tunnels and chambers beneath the city of Lima. The tunnels were reportedly constructed by Spanish forces during the colonial period, and were later used as a hideout by rebel forces during the War of Independence. While the location of the treasure of Lima remains a mystery, the legend of the treasure continues to inspire fascination and speculation among treasure hunters and adventurers around the world. Whether or not the treasure will ever be found remains to be seen, but the search for the elusive treasure is sure to continue for many years to come. The Treasure of the Esperanza The Treasure of the Esperanza is a legendary treasure said to have been hidden by Spanish forces during the Mexican-American War in the mid-19th century. According to the legend, the treasure consists of a vast collection of gold, silver, jewels, and other precious objects valued at millions of dollars. The story of the treasure of the Esperanza dates back to 1846, when the Mexican-American conflict broke out between the United States and Mexico. As the war raged on, a Spanish galleon named the Esperanza was reportedly sailing off the coast of Mexico, carrying a valuable cargo of gold, silver, and other treasures. In order to avoid capture by the American forces, the crew of the Esperanza reportedly buried the treasure on a remote island off the coast of Mexico. The location of the island and the treasure's hiding place were reportedly marked by a set of cryptic clues and symbols known only to the crew of the galleon. Over the years, the legend of the treasure of the Esperanza has inspired countless treasure hunters and adventurers to search for the lost treasure. Many stories have emerged of treasure hunters who claim to have discovered the location of the treasure only to be thwarted by deadly traps or treacherous terrain. Despite the persistent search, the location of the treasure of the Esperanza has never been definitively discovered and the treasure remains one of the most elusive and sought-after treasures in the world. In recent years, however, new evidence has emerged that suggests that the treasure may be located on the coast of Mexico, near the site where the Esperanza was last seen. Some treasure hunters believe that the clues to the treasure's location are hidden in ancient maps and documents, while others believe that advanced technology, such as ground-penetrating radar, may be used to locate the treasure. While the location of the treasure of the Esperanza remains a mystery, the legend of the treasure continues to inspire fascination and speculation among treasure hunters and adventurers around the world. Whether or not the treasure will ever be found remains to be seen, but the search for the elusive treasure is sure to continue for many years to come. Who were the mysterious sea people? Though there were many ancient civilizations that had existed during the 12th century BC, suddenly and quite unexpectedly, nearly every civilization was wiped from the face of the earth except for the cities of Egypt. This phenomenon was recorded as the late Bronze Age collapse, and it's said that only small villages survived this sudden catastrophe. For many decades, the cause of such an occurrence had widely been unknown and shrouded in mystery. That was until the ancient language of the Egyptian hieroglyphics had been decoded and allowed us to read the historical records captured at the time by the last standing ancient civilization. This record has led to countless theories and endless debate amongst Egyptologists, classic historians and archaeologists since its findings. Over 2,000 years before the Vikings sailed from today's Scandinavia to plague the Europeans, the ancient world empires faced a terrifying sea-traveling enemy of their own, and that has remained a mystery up to today. During the Bronze Age, the Sea People caused terror in the Mediterranean and Egyptian lands, but their origin and identity has remained a mystery until this day. An inscription written in the 13th century BC said that they came from the sea in their ships and that nobody could defeat them. Reportedly, 
By the historical accounts of the ancient Egyptians, armies of what had been referred to at the time as Sea People attacked and demolished the cities of man. In fact, the descriptions of the armies of the Sea People describe monsters and giants coming from the oceans and waging war against all of civilization. The reasoning for why this sudden onslaught had occurred has yet to be understood, but what's surprising is the vast amount of theories surrounding the events. Accounts continue of the Egyptians attempting to track the source of the beasts that appeared humanoid in nature, and it's reported that they found hundreds of footprints coming from the beaches of the Mediterranean Sea. Today, after uncovering vast art depicting the battles, documents detailing the events, and further evidence of war and tactics used against the destroyed and forgotten civilizations of the past, the proof of the account of the Sea People appears to be overwhelming in nature. As a matter of fact, the events are so overwhelming that the discussion surrounding the event in the scientific community has been somewhat confusing, and further theories or attempts at uncovering the truth are treated with ridicule. The Egyptian inscriptions provide almost all there is to know about the Sea People, apart from the references in the letters from Assyrians and Hittites that have contributed to the subject. They were also mentioned in the Egyptian literature, the tale of Wenemum, where they appear as familiar figures in the Mediterranean land. Who were the Sea People that invaded ancient Egypt? Everything known about the Sea People comes from apocalyptic inscriptions that were made by the empires they battled, especially ancient Egyptians, since they did not leave any written records or monuments of their own. One early reference goes back to the 1300 BC during the ruling of Pharaoh Merempta, as he claimed of taking out over 6,000 seafarers after they allied with the Libyans. An even more detailed account from Ramses III who fought with the Sea People back in 1170 described them as having moved southwestern towns in Turkey, Levant and Cyprus, desolating its residents and leaving the city as if it had never existed. The Ekwesh have been related to the Ahiyawa in the records of Hitti, who may be Achaean Greeks who colonized the western Anatolian coast and the Aegean islands. They consisted of sea raiders who invaded the towns at the Mediterranean coast between 1276 and 1178 BC, focusing mostly on Egypt. History considers them as the major contributors to the collapse of the Bronze Age between 1250 and 1150 BC. Where did the Sea People come from? Scholars are still not certain of the origins of these groups, but many trace them to Sicily, Turkey's Anatolia region, or the Aegean Sea. Some modern historians have a theory that the ancient Egyptians knew the origins of the Sea People based on what they wrote about them. Due to the fact that these Egyptian inscriptions did not mention the origins of the groups, some historians believe that their origin was so obvious that it did not need to be written down. There are some speculations, with little evidence that the Sea People were in fact the Philistines of the Bible, who probably battled with ancient Israel, but who they are is still a mystery. Their origin has also been proposed and strongly disputed to be Trojan. From Italy, Philistine or Minoa, however, nothing has been discovered so far to shed more light on the question of their origin. Whether all this is true or not, the fact remains that the Sea People's origins are not written in any records and that information is therefore lost to history. What did they want? Equally mysterious is the motivation of the Sea People to ravage the Mediterranean. Some historians believe that they were displaced from their original home by natural disaster or famine. Other researchers state that the Sea People were Trojans displaced after they lost their kingdom to the Reeks in the Trojan battle. Whether the Trojan War story is true or is just a mythical story is unknown. The Sea People attacked many cities and Mediterranean settlements but seemingly had an affinity for Egypt, attacking three different pharaohs. Their intentions for an attack, however, despite much research, remains a mystery to this day. What happened once they took over Egypt? Even though their origin remains unknown, tantalizing pieces of information about the damage that the Sea People inflicted on the ancient worlds are available thanks to the inscriptions the witnesses of the devastation left. Most of the current studies of the Sea People come from the inscriptions left behind from Rameses III's reign. Emmanuel de Rouge, a French Egyptologist, came up with the term Sea People in 1855 because reports claimed that they originated from the sea or islands but did not specify the particular ones. There were three pharaohs who recorded their interaction with these raiders, Rameses II, Merempta, who was his son and successor, and Rameses III. 
All three pharaohs were victorious over their enemies, and their inscriptions provided more detail about the existence of the Sea People. Ramses II and his inscriptions Ramses II was one of the greatest rulers of ancient Egyptian history, with accomplishments including securing his borders from invasion by nomads and also securing trade routes that were vital to their economy. In his inscriptions, he mentions the Sea People as allies of the Hittites and mercenaries in his own army. He does not mention anything about their identity or where they came from. Ramses inscribed his victory over the Sea People in a war off the Egyptian coast. According to what he inscribed, the battle involved only the Sherdan tribe of the Sea People and after the war. Many were recruited into Ramses's army. In his inscriptions, Ramses made the impression that he neutralized the threat. However, his successor's inscriptions claimed otherwise. The Inscription of Meremta The Sea People troubled Meremta's reign, especially after they allied with the Libyans in the Nile Delta invasion. From his inscriptions in his fifth year, the Libyan chief allied with the Sea People invading Egypt. Meremta describes the Sea People in his inscriptions as formidable adversaries and took pride in defeating them. He claimed complete victory over the Sea People, securing the Egyptian borders. He celebrated his victory by immortalizing its inscription in the Meremta Stele, announcing how he brought peace to his land by subduing the enemy. Where did they go afterward? Ramses III knew of the clashes of the Sea People with his predecessors and opted for guerrilla tactics instead of field engagements with his predecessors. He organized ambushes along the coast and down the Nile Delta, hiding his archers along the shore so that they could rain arrows on the ships when he gave the signal. After confirming that no crew on the ship were alive, they set the downing vessels on fire with flaming arrows. After crushing the sea attacks, Ramses III focused on what was left of the Sea People on land. He used the same tactics and finally defeated the Sea People in 1170 right BC. After being defeated by Ramses III, the Sea People disappeared from history. However, according to San Jose State University, the Egyptians allowed the remaining Sea People to settle in today's Israel and Palestine. Despite the win over the Sea People, the battle drained the Egyptian royal treasury, rendering it unable to pay its tomb builders. This resulted in the first recorded labor strike in history, where the workers refused to work until they were fully paid. The Mysterious Sea Serpent Encounter of Hans Egede Hans Egede was a Norwegian-Danish Lutheran missionary who founded the settlement of Nuuk in Greenland in the early 18th century. In 1734, he reported seeing a sea serpent in the waters near Greenland, which he described in detail. According to Egede's account, the sea serpent was approximately 60 feet long, with a head the size of a horse's head and a long, slender neck. He noted that the creature moved quickly through the water, with its head and neck often visible above the surface. Ejedi also described the serpent's skin as being covered in rough, hard scales, with a color that was a mixture of gray and black. He noted that the serpent had two large, round eyes that were yellow in color, and that it had a large mouth filled with sharp teeth. Egidi's account of the sea serpent was met with some skepticism at the time, and many people believed that he had simply seen a large fish or some other aquatic creature. However, the report of the sea serpent caught the attention of naturalists and other scientists, and it helped to spark a renewed interest in the study of marine biology and oceanography. In the years since Egidi's sighting, there have been numerous other reports of sea serpents and other mysterious creatures in the world's oceans. The Mysterious Disappearance of David Guerrero David Guerrero was a 21-year-old student who disappeared in the early hours of March 8, 2005, in downtown Austin, Texas. His disappearance has remained a mystery for over a decade, with no solid leads or conclusive evidence of what happened to him. On the night of March 7, 2005, David and his friends were celebrating spring break and had visited several bars in the downtown area. They eventually ended up at a popular nightclub located on East 6th Street. David was last seen leaving the club at around 2 in the morning. He was reportedly walking towards his car, which was parked several blocks away. David never made it home that night, and his family and friends immediately became concerned when they were unable to reach him. They reported him missing to the Austin Police Department on March 9, 2005. Over the years, there have been several leads and possible sightings of David, 
but none of them have led to any conclusive evidence of his whereabouts. In 2006, a private investigator hired by David's family received a tip that he had been spotted in Mexico, but this lead ultimately turned out to be a dead end. In 2011, the case received renewed attention when a witness came forward claiming to have seen David in a homeless camp in downtown Austin shortly after his disappearance. The witness described a man matching David's description and claimed to have spoken to him briefly. However, despite an extensive search of the area, no further evidence was found. The circumstances surrounding David's disappearance are still a mystery, and his case remains unsolved. His family and friends continue to hold out hope that he will one day be found, and the Austin Police Department has stated that they will continue to investigate any new leads or information that comes to light. A full moon may affect human behavior. There has been a long-standing belief that the full moon can cause behavior changes in humans, including increased aggression, with some reports saying that people reported that they couldn't control themselves. Several studies have examined the relationship between the full moon and behavior changes, but although the results have been interesting, they have been somewhat inconsistent. Some studies have found a correlation between the full moon and increased hospital admissions for psychiatric emergencies, while others have found no such relationship. One possible explanation for the belief in full moon behavior changes is the psychological phenomenon of confirmation bias. This is the tendency to notice and remember information that confirms our pre-existing beliefs or expectations, while disregarding information that contradicts them. In other words, people may be more likely to notice instances of aggressive behavior during a full moon and attribute them to the lunar cycle, while overlooking similar behavior at other times. Another possible explanation is the placebo effect, in which people experience a change in behavior simply because they expect to. If someone believes that the full moon will cause them to become more unstable, they may act in ways that confirm this belief, even if there is no direct causal relationship between the moon and their behavior. So, what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.